it does start from the top, and that's not a criticism of anyone else. It's not to suggest that our positions are more important than anybody else. But I think in order for faculty to feel free, in order for students to feel free, the president's got to say something. The president has to articulate with clarity that he or she supports the free expression of ideas on a college campus, because if we cannot do that on a college campus, we cannot do that anywhere. All right, let's dive in. Well, again, welcome to Heterodox Academy's uh, monthly virtual discussion event. Uh, we're glad to have everyone here and looking forward to a great conversation today. Our topic is how can universities reform themselves to protect open inquiry on campus? Uh, my name is Michael Regnier. I'm the executive director at HXA, as we fondly call it. And uh, I'm joined by some wonderful panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, first, I'd like to do a couple of our standard reminders. Um, we like to practice what we preach at HXA, and that even includes on Zoom and on these virtual events. So we'll encourage everyone to follow the HXA way uh, as we see here on screen. I'll also uh, invite everybody to uh, use the features of Zoom, drop your questions in the Q&A box. You see another great question by someone else given an up vote. Um, and we've learned through experience uh, that the more we bring in your questions, uh, the livelier the conversation we, we end up getting. So thank you in advance for, uh, for making this an interactive afternoon. Uh, I'd like to also uh, invite everyone who's not currently a member of Heterodox Academy to join us. Uh, membership is free if you're a professor, an administrator, or a staff member at a college or a university. Uh, we are uh, looking to elevate the university and the academy from within. Uh, we are advocates of open inquiry and viewpoint diversity and constructive disagreement on campus. And we have all kinds of ways to get involved. So you can uh, join us at heterodoxacademy.org, follow us online, and I'll repeat uh, that pitch again at the end of the presentation. But if you like what you see here today, uh, and if you like who you're chatting with today, even if you don't agree with them, uh, we hope you'll be a part of HXA. All right. Well, I am so pleased uh, to welcome our guests uh, for this afternoon, our, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis is a former winner of the HXA uh, Open Inquiry Award. Uh, she is, of course, the president and CEO of Benedict College. We're glad to have her here. Um, Many of you know uh, Professor Mark McNeely of the Keenan Flagler Business School at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, he's also a co-chair of our campus community uh, for the Tar Heels. And uh, Jennifer Townsend is an adjunct instructor and assistant to the Lee Honors College Dean at Western Michigan University, uh, also uh, involved in leading our campus community there. And uh, I'm just Pleased to have the three of you uh, with me today on, on such a timely topic. Um, many colleges and universities are taking or restating or reconsidering their institutional commitments to open inquiry, free speech, free expression on campus. Sometimes that's been in response to external pressures or on-campus incidents. Um, and sometimes it, it involves uh, the influence of groups, whether they're outside groups or folks like our HXA campus communities who are interested in promoting these values on campus and sort of working from within. Um, but in what some people are calling the year of free speech or the year of academic freedom, it's not quite clear what we're supposed to make of this trend. Uh, when so many university presidents are, are making statements like this, and it's so much in the headlines, uh, hard to know how to separate out what's very meaningful. Is some of it just lip service? Is some of it signs of real progress? And sort of related to that, uh, it isn't just Heterodox Academy, but other groups that are coming together within universities to, to organize and activate uh, for, for these values on campus. So what can we, what can we sort of learn about what that uh, what that could mean. So again, uh, welcome to to my uh, esteemed panelists this afternoon. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a basic question, um, and uh, maybe Mark, I can I can start with you. Um, sure. When you think about uh, academic uh, ecosystem that is a college or a university, uh, yeah. what are some of the the levers that 
faculty can be working on and, and pressing on um, if they're interested in advancing open inquiry? Yeah, I think I've been talking around this the idea of a parallel polis, um, which comes from the Czech, Czechoslovakian dissidents, uh, Václav Havel and Václav Benda. Basically, what their idea was during the communist rule, not saying that we are living under communism, let me be clear, um, but under under communist rule, they, they were saying we have to set up a, an alternative set of institutions and individuals separate from the state, but eventually with the, you know, working together as a civil society, living in truth, right, working together, a network um, that can then over time influence the state and be there, you know, when it when it goes. And so when I think of the there's an ecosystem, as you said, so heterodox academy is obviously a big part of it. Um, Fire, I think, is a big part of it. Uh, we are you know, the USC Alumni Free Speech Association is another part that's big for us. And then within our university, we've done, of course, Heterodox Academy or, or Heterodox Heels group, um, I think has been really big, really helpful to getting uh, faculty to know each other. And we have been typically hosting dinners with them um, and just having discussing, you know, academic topics, um, a lot of controversial ones. And um, we have a listserv of about 80 professors as well that we discuss academic freedom issues on. We've started a uh, committee for Academic Freedom and Free Expression, which was started by the Chancellor. We have the UNC Program for Public Discourse, which is another sort of, it's within the UNC, but, it's, you know, let's say it's separate, separate. And then now we're supposed to be getting, or we are getting the School for Civic Life and Leadership, which is yet another institution. So I think you need an ecosystem. And you also need, especially in a public university where the dominant ideology is on the left, um, even though the the people don't like it, but having someone on the outside that is not a, that is open to free expression, constructive dialogue, and viewpoint diversity, pushing the university in that direction, I think is helpful. So inside and outside, kind of working together. But that makes mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely, and and of course, the one thing we've really learned from our uh, campus communities is just how varied the landscape is, depending on which state you're in, if you're in public or private, what the local uh, controversies are. Um, Jennifer, you've been involved at Western Michigan in sort of creating a, a new community there. And I, I think starting to work with even some of the, the university administration as they think about the commitments that Western Michigan has. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and sort of what's your perspective on that same question? Um, sure. So we are working at, we, under this sort of umbrella uh, advisory board called We Talk, and we've worked with people like Irshad Manji um, and others. Bridge USA. Uh, we attempted to bring Bridge USA, and and that didn't work out quite so well. Um, it, but other organizations from outside to come and partner with us at the university in order to promote viewpoint diversity and civil discourse on campus. Um, it sort of started around the time of, of the 2000, it was a, sort of an anticipation of the 2020 election and how we might be able to promote civil discourse on campus uh, and prevent uh, a lot of unrest. Of course, then COVID got involved and everything was weird anyway. And so it wasn't as big of an issue as we were anticipating. Um, but we've continued to uh, do what we can to provide and, and promote programming on campus. And, and our biggest challenge, I think, has been convincing students to get involved. And I think that's a challenge for everyone on every campus. Students are very focused on what they need to get done in order to get out of here. Um, and they're not that interested in what they can do to promote these ideals and values on campus. Um, when they are passionate about something, they don't necessarily feel like they have time to hear the other side. Um, so that's the one challenge that we're facing right now. Uh, ostensibly, the, the administration on our campus uh, is, is very pro-free speech. They've certainly voiced that publicly, that they're in favor of viewpoint diversity and open inquiry. And um, We Talk was founded uh, initially by our uh, Vice President for Government Relations. And so we do have that very strong voice on the administration working with us. So, you know, we've had our successes and our failures and, and we just keep going. Thank you so much. Um, 
So Dr. Artis, uh, you have the perspective of a college president and probably have a little bit different view out your window than uh, many of the professors who are on our event today. Um, what is your take on this, this whole phenomenon of official statements and pronouncements? And uh, is, is there a piece of this conversation that, that you'd sort of like to add to because maybe, it, maybe it's been missing so far? You know, I, I think I'm glad to use the word, word perspective. Um, we have a campaign on our campus called Perspectives, uh, incidentally, uh, that is designed to stimulate both student staff and faculty, all constituencies really, to feel free to express their unique perspectives. I think um, statements and pronouncements are of limited value. Uh, we all sign off on support statements on a whole host of things, right? Most recently, you're hearing um, things re relative to um, student financial aid. We've all signed on saying we're going to be more clear in promoting um, student financial aid and the availability of resources. That's just a statement, right? Unless the financial aid office is committed to it, it doesn't really happen. And so while I have signed on to a whole host of things, Citizens and Scholars is, is the most recent initiative I'm a part of with 12 other um, college and university presidents from across the country, where we have stood up and said very clearly, we support the value of free speech on our campuses and that we're going to work diligently to ensure that it in fact exists, lives and breathes on our campuses. And those institutions are all very, very diverse. I, I think leadership does start from the top and that's not a criticism of anyone else. And it's not to suggest that our positions are more important than anybody else. But I think in order for faculty to feel free, in order for students to feel free, the president's gotta say something. The president has to articulate with clarity that he or she supports the free expression of ideas on a college campus, because if we cannot do that on a college campus, we cannot do that anywhere. I think these are really the best places. These are the incubators of freedom, if you will. Yes, they have historically been uh, bending, and I would um, suggest that our private institutions aren't much different in terms of leaning a bit left, but that is all the more reason that the president and those in leadership positions have to be clear in articulating the value of all perspectives, left, right, center. Um, we go to great lengths in our institution, simple things like making sure the TVs and the student lounges um, re reference the diversity. So Fox is on one and CNN is on another, right? I mean, we want to make sure. Now, whether you want to hear it or see it is a horse of different color, you can choose your side of the room. But we as an institution have to make clear that we value all opinions, perspectives, and ideas. And I think this leading from the top piece is critically important, and it's far more than a simple statement. I think statements are of very limited value in this conversation. Thank you. And if you can please talk to the people who run the airports about the television issue, uh, that would be great. <laughs> I'm on. Uh, what, what? I think that uh, I, I want to bring in all the panelists to sort of open up the conversation, but I guess just one follow-up um, to you, uh, Rosalind. I, I sometimes hear university presidents uh, sounding like they're in an improv class because it's always yes and. It's we believe in free speech and open inquiry and academic freedom and, you know, choose your synonyms and also, you know, the right of you know personal dignity or social justice or whatever it may be. Um, not to say that free speech and different kinds of freedom are not, are incompatible with other values, uh, but one sometimes gets the sense that uh, the rub is in how you trade those off or how you try to honor both at the same time. Um, ha have you encountered that? Have you seen that in the dialogue? I know you you follow this issue closely. I do, and I think. Um, that is perhaps an accurate statement. Um, I, I think that we try to be politically correct. We try to be careful in articulating that we value free speech, except when. Um, except that except when is a very slippery slope. And I think it is not as difficult as we make it. I think um, human dignity is a slippery concept. What offends me may not offend you. Um, I do think we have to thicken up our skin a little bit um, on dealing with things that may be uncomfortable. Um, I've often been heard to say the brain is a muscle. We need to work with that muscle. And sometimes it burns a little bit, just like it does if you go to a gym and you're working your glutes, right? Um, both are a pain in the ass. And you have, to, you have to be willing to push through and do the work. And so I think that we use the and um, almost as an excuse sometimes, as opposed to really to ampl amplifying our position. Free speech, unless um, it causes uh, not harm, not intellectual harm, not, but we provide physical safety, 
right? We say to our students, you are safe on this campus. We will do everything to ensure your physical safety, but your intellectual safety is in great danger here. Uh, we want to push you to think outside the box and to use that muscle that is your brain. Thank you. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about what this can look like on the ground or some different directions that it can take. Uh, Mark or Jennifer, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I've also got some questions from the chat. Or, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on Rosalind's point <laughs> about uh, statements. I think statements are a necessary but insufficient condition for change on campus. <clears throat> I think there's basically the way I try and think about it is there's four things that you need to do. It's sort of like four C's. So one is one is codes, and I don't mean speech codes, but I mean what are the policies, laws, um that we have in place right that support free expression so it's sort of the legal basis for what we're doing so that's the codes and then the second part is culture because you can have all the codes you want and if the culture just ignores it or finds a way around it which i think happens often um then then it's really all for naught right it is just talk so you need to fundamentally change the culture well culture is made up of humans and these people, you know, it's very hard to change humans. So, so the way you would have to change humans is a couple other ways, right? You'd have to state what the cultural values are and which are primary. And the second, so then the two other C's would be communications. There's got to be communications from the top down and people showing up at these events from the top and all the way through the organization. So not just from the top and the chancellor and the provost, but, you know, the deans and the department chairs, um, which will take some time. And then the last part is competency. So I think the way you get around the, you know, free speech versus hate speech is you you give people competencies to understand what is free speech, what is a heckler's video, 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 <laughs> veto, and how to have constructive dialogues, especially the constructive dialogue piece, because it's hard to do that. You know, it's it's a skill that you have to acquire. And but if you're able to get people to have constructive dialogues, the concern about, you know, offending people should be lessened, right? Because people are trying to be sensitive and, and have a conversation that, you know, isn't just, I'm telling you what I I want you, you need to hear, right? <clears throat> I think that one way to approach doing that, one way to approach teaching students constructive dialogue is to model that in your classrooms, right? So if if instructors or faculty are getting up in front of the class and making it clear from the beginning of the semester that the free exchange of ideas is what is required for us all to learn and to be successful. And this is how we have those conversations. Then I think that that is a huge step towards changing the culture on campus. And I think that that's something that we are have moved away from. Uh, we don't think about putting that in our syllabi. We don't think about making that blanket statement at the beginning of class. And uh, so a lot of students are afraid to speak up because they're afraid that they're going to go against the, the prevailing narrative in class of what the other students are saying, or they're afraid that they're going to offend their professors. And they're not being taught those skills that they need that will carry forward as they after they graduate and go out in the world. And then they can become better citizens, right? That's what we're hoping for. So I think if, if we start in the classroom, the, that's going to be monumental. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you, I think that's a really excellent articulation of where we need to be. And I think shameless plug, right, for H HXA. When we started this conversation 10 minutes ago, the ground rules were established and they were pretty basic. Um, support your arguments with evidence, examples where possible. Be mutually respectful, be yourself, be authentic, be authentic um, in your expressions. Those are as basic as share, uh, get along with your neighbor, say please and thank you. I mean, the very same rules that we start teaching children in kindergarten, don't wanna be pithy about everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. But sincerely, at the outset of this conversation, those very clear four, five, six ground rules really can guide us in a very obvious way when we think about education and to your point about modeling, our faculty are so critically important in this effort because we all believe in free speech until somebody says something we don't like. Um, and so, and students are going to test limits. Students are going to test limits as they should, right? They pay money for this learning experience that is supposed to be, um, supposed to be growth experience for them, supposed to teach them how to think more critically. They are going to test boundaries. 
Um, and if the faculty member, if the administration is unwilling, listen, I love protest until they're sitting in front of my office, right? I've got to be okay with them sitting in front of my office and be willing to engage and listen um, to their perspective. And I think the modeling point that you made just really can't be understated. Overstated, excuse me. Right. Hmm. Um, one of the advisors uh, to HXA, uh, Professor Robert George from Princeton recently was the object of a shout down you may have seen in the headlines. And one of the news accounts quoted a, a student saying, well, we know they can't expel us all. And so that struck me as uh, among other things, an educational failure because there's great room for protest there's a difference between that and the heckler's veto that Mark mentioned. Um, but if that's the main lesson you're getting from a college experience, then I, I kind of fear for the future a little bit. I think the student, I think part of the problem too, is the student is the customer attitude, right? So we can't get them upset at all. And to your point about the protest, I mean, basically no one's, no administrator that I've seen so far is willing to stand up and remove people from classrooms, A, and then follow through with suspensions or expulsion. So there is no there is no downside. There's only upside for the people that are protesting. They're going to be heroes in front of their friends. They will have made their point, right? So I think there's just, if you think about the incentives, <clears throat> until until someone's, someone, someone's kid gets expelled from like Stanford or, you know, a top school, <laughs> It's going to continue. There's no, there's no stopping it. If anyone in the in the uh, room uh, is is from Stanford, I think that's a really interesting case where the the dean issued a a, a memo and sort of called for some re-education. But to, to your point, Mark, I don't know what kind of consequences were involved. Uh, and of course, there's so many of these, and each of each of them have different different nuances. Um, let me um, let me pull in a couple of questions as we've got a nice uh, Q&A going here. Um, so uh, one question comes from Jacqueline, and, and I think uh, you touched on this briefly, Mark, but we hear this a lot. Her question is, how do you counter the idea that speech is harm? And, you know, it's probably hard to overstate how prevalent that sentiment is. And, you know, to try to steel man it for a moment, you know, people will say, uh, you know, we're, we're social creatures, we humans, and, and you know, psychological harm is real. And, you know, we need to, uh, we need to take this seriously. Um, if we have concern for respect and other great virtues like that, then how could we tolerate and then, you know, fill in the, the expression that you're objecting to? Um, it's something I'm here at the Center for Academic Pluralism in New York, where our fellows, some of them are chewing on this question. But any any thoughts on, on that from, from your campus? In other words, how do we counter the idea that speech is harm, quote unquote? I mean, I think I think you can acknowledge that, yes, words can be hurtful. I don't think you can. I, I think it's wrong to conflate it that, you know, with the, the idea that words are violent. I don't think those are the two 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 same things. Um, and I think also the other thing that we need to do is really get back to teaching students resilience. I mean, the the environment um, is going to only get more dynamic. It's going to get more, you know, chaotic in terms of with generative AI and how technology is changing. What's changing in the world with rising China? Um, what's happening in Ukraine? Um, I think this the world is going to be changing faster and faster. And instead of telling people you're going to have a safe space, we need to say we're going to make you resilient. We're going to make you anti-fragile so you can grow from the challenges you face. And part of that is hearing things that might upset you. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't I don't think we can go down the path of of stopping free expression because of it isn't our fundamental responsibility as educators um, very much what you just said, whether we characterize it as anti-fragility or resilience or whatever the case may be, it's teaching kids to cope. Uh, it's teaching kids to process information, um, to respond um, in a manner that is coherent and articulate and clear, 
Um, I, I serve at a historically black college. Um, my, my population is homogenous to some extent, right? And there's this assumption that everybody on my campus feels a certain way, right? That everyone is a Democrat, that everyone is liberal, that everyone is, and that may or may not be the case. And it's really none of my concern, quite frankly. Everyone is entitled to their own perspective. And yet this myopia that settles in um, creates this really strange experience for a student who is courageous enough to be different. And so one of the questions is, you know, how are we protecting people from being shouted down and those kinds of things? It is teaching students the skill, the art of listening, of engaging in a meaningful way, of respectful dialogue that is evidence-based, um, and at the very least thoughtful. It's okay to say, I feel, that hurts me, uh, I am offended by, and then be okay with the response. And so um, I, I think the fundamental goal of education really is to teach students to cope and to be participants in a civil society. And that requires some level of resilience and strength. Thank you. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. One of the things that I tell my students, which is something that I, I borrowed from, of all places, the Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, I, the the idea that the way you you choose to react, the way that you react. So you have a, a certain amount of control over how you react to statements that offend you and statements that hurt your feelings. You know we yes, words hurt, yes, words can cause some psychological damage, but, you know, when we were growing up, it was always sticks and stones, maybe with my bones, but words can never hurt me, and somewhere along the way, we've kind of lost that, and I was thinking recently about how, you know, these were sort of mostly Gen X, and we were raised kind of in this feral way, and so, you know, we're kind of like Teflon with, with a lot of things, and then we've turned around and raised our kids to be very, very overly protected to sort of counterbalance the way we grew up, I think. And uh, I, we've overcorrected in a lot of ways. And so he, obviously we can't do anything about the way the kids have been raised now, but we can help steer them in the classroom. Well, I think it also gets back to the search for truth, right? I mean, if if you go back to the purpose of the university, and this is where I think we have to move the university back to, because I think we've gotten off of that path, as Jonathan has pointed out with the, you know, what's the telos of the university. And if you go back to this, this, we are in a pursuit of truth or searching for truth, then everything should be on the table that we can debate whether, you know, what, what these different things mean and how do we, you know, we're all searching for truth and that we should hold our beliefs, you know, fairly lightly. Um, and so when people, I think there was a comment by Ursula in the in the chat about, you know, it's about ideology and propaganda. It's like you we I think we can't just accept the the the, the narratives of and the assumptions behind some of the ideologies. And I think we have to be willing to test those in in class and in conversations with students. And to do that, you know, obviously you've got to feel fairly comfortable that your university is going to back you up. And I think that's a whole nother problem with universities is that a lot of professors realize that they're going to be hung out to dry if they if they make any mistake. And, that, and secondly, I think the data that we we found at UNC and the data you see from FIRE um, is that students are willing to report other students and students are willing to report professors trying to get them fired. And so, yeah, I mean, if you don't if you don't have my back, you know, Miss Ms. Administrator. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna self censor myself in class as a professor. I mean, hmm. um, Roslyn, did you want to get in on that one? I think you're on mute right now. I, I actually agree with Mark uh, on that point, and I'm really. Um, I'm really interested. I'm following the Q and A in the chat, and I really think um, Jacqueline really hit the nail on the head in her discussion of sort of safety and limitations and things like that. And so I, I, I would certainly encourage everyone to read what she had to say there. But I really want to inter interrogate one of the questions I see here in the Q and A about this notion, um, the unwillingness to be uncomfortable as a result of our really going more vocational, 
right? College is a means of getting a job and you've got to get ready for the workforce. And this is really all about learning a trade or a skill or learning to go get a job um, that stunts this intellectual growth argument, the real purpose of a college or university. I, I think that's a really interesting observation and it merits some interrogation. I, I think that's part of the challenge. I, I would agree with whoever submitted that comment. And I might suggest that employers desperately will need uh, in this increasingly polarized world, individuals who um, can listen, hear, receive, um, challenge, interrogate, respond, and critically analyze ideas, thoughts, and still get the work done. I, I think that is absolutely invaluable. And I think, um, again, the observer here is absolutely correct that part of this shift in focus away from um, the search for truth, new ideas, new knowledge, creativity, and critical thinking toward a more vocational approach to education is absolutely part of the problem, but should likewise be part of the solution. Employers have an interest here in seeing to it that individuals can think critically and contribute in a meaningful way uh, to civic society. I sometimes wonder about those who are, who are not enrolling in college because of perceptions about some of these issues. We've started to see some poll data and, and enrollment data that suggests there's maybe a silent constituency out there saying, we're gonna pass on this altogether. Um, couple of comments from the chat I'd like to, I'd like to share. Um, Anthony uh, shares, um, and hi Anthony, thanks for joining us, another campus community co-chair. He says, as a sociologist, I've been trained to appreciate the fact that a modern society is characterized by plurality. Hannah Arendt emphasized this as well. We seem to have gone from valuing plurality to privileging uniformity. That's not what a modern society is supposed to be all about. Um, and uh, so I will I will leave that out there. And then I will also, uh, there was a good question from Emily, just as we're talking about the rhetoric on this issue. Um, she says, uh, even if students don't believe speech is harm, many argue against free speech by telling controversial speakers that quote unquote, speech has consequences. Um, it certainly is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, <laughs> the consequences that I'm not gonna let you talk, um, but is there something there that, that we need to be grappling with? I think the thing that I would say is that speech has some consequences. That doesn't mean you can decide what those consequences are. So your consequences, if you're a speaker, you know, speaking and have been invited um, as a protester, I can't force the consequences on you of shouting you down. And if you try to do that, then there will be consequences for you, right? I mean, this, this is the problem. There's never any consequences for those that do that. So it's like, yeah, there's, you know, if you want to do some some speech that's not actually allowed, you know, allowed speech, there's going to be consequences, right? So I think we have to make clear, like, yeah, some consequences, like you can walk out, right? You cannot go. Um, you can ask difficult questions, but you can't do a heckler's veto. So yeah, some consequences are allowed and some consequences are not. And then how you comport yourself also has consequences. Well, I, I think if the assertion that speech has consequences is designed as a warning to stifle speech, then we've really gone too far in the opposite direction, right? Uh, of course, hate speech has consequences, but all free speech what might elicit a, elicit a response, not a consequence, right? I think the use of that verbiage is really almost a threat. Um, and that goes against everything we believe in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a... Uh... There's a, there's a scary element to that when we think about some historic precedents. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanna ask a question that I did not prepare, but just kind of occurs to me as we're talking. Um, you know, there there is uh, such a thing as very clear, uh, clearly objectionable practices, such as literally shouting someone down, not allowing their event to proceed, unplugging their microphones, swarming their hall, all, all those sorts of things. Um, but there's also this more nebulous zone of free association, social approval or disapproval, um, 
that uh, is not necessarily a violation of free speech, but I, I think many HXA members feel, at least in certain circumstances, like there's a certain grace or charity or um, tolerance uh, that even if you're allowed to uh, not practice, you should, because there's just something to be said for looking for that kernel of, of truth or wisdom, even when somebody seems crazy or, or you don't trust them or it's an argument that you're just not persuaded by. That's where it gets really hard to navigate those issues for me, more so than the very clear cut violations. I mean, is there something and maybe I can I can go back to you, Rosalind. I mean, you 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 run a, a community uh, that I, I've I've listened to a couple of your other podcasts and you've described as, you know, loving and and um, and inclusive in different ways and very focused on, you know, education and educational uh, outcomes. I mean, how do you think about about that that issue in, in your context when it's not just following the rules, but those norms that are a little harder to pin down? Uh, I, I think civility is critically important, and I use that in a very generic sense. And I think you have to do some work to ensure that. Um, mm -hmm. We have certainly had guests to our campus that have been um, unwelcomed in many respects. And we did the work up front, and that's not a back pad or, you know, but it was um, at a time period where things were very, very volatile. And so pulling our students together and saying, listen, the world is watching. Uh, we, we will stand and demonstrate that we um, are respectful and decent and civil and that we can engage in a discourse that may not be, we may not, we may have disagreements, but we won't be disagreeable. I mean, that's also cachet and flip. But we've really spent a lot of time having that conversation and allowing students to express themselves kind of beforehand. And then we did have a conversation about consequences, right? I used consequences at that time and said, this is not who we will be. If you don't like it, you don't have to come. If you choose to divorce yourself from this event, if you choose to not be on campus that day, that's fine. There will be no consequence to that. Um, but we will not tolerate destruction of property. We will not tolerate disrespectful behavior. We will not tolerate physical harm of any kind to anyone. We will not tolerate things that have the likelihood to cast this institution as a very negative light on the national or global stage. And so, you know, we let students express themselves sort of in advance. And I think there is no substitute for putting in the work. There's no substitute for having the tough conversations with students. And, you know, I, um, I have the luxury of leading a small institution. You know, we're 2000 students. So it's it's a little easier for me than perhaps it is for Chapel Hill, right, to come together and you have an assembly and say, let's all get on page before we have this, you know, really controversial speaker. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm just lucky, I guess, in that regard. But I, I do think um, faculty can be tremendous allies and advocates in this effort. I, I think, you know, at all levels of the academic experience, including, you know, student affairs and co-curricular activities, you have to be willing to have the competition, do the work and not tolerate or accept behavior that is inconsistent with the practice of civility and grace and decency. I, I think so much of this is setting expectations and in, in the guidelines and, the, and people knowing the rules. So I think Rosalind, I mean, that's an amazing job that you do that. But I think telling people, I mean, we're, we passed a law in North Carolina where you're supposed to, um, each university during orientation is supposed to tell them you know, spend time explaining free expression and what's allowed, right? And and like what UNC does, which I think is insufficient, it was like one slide of literally two sentences in orientation run by student life and leadership. And, you know, they have not say anything about the heckler's veto, what's, you know, what is and isn't allowed. And so it's like, you've got to do it. Um, and then you've got to also say the rules are if this happens. And then, as, as I think Rosalind said, tell them what the consequences are of breaking the rules. I think for the most part at Western, we haven't really had any incidents where we've had speakers shut down. We haven't really had a lot of overt protest. There's been a, some threat of protest from student groups that just kind of didn't happen. So I think... I don't know if we're just lucky that way or if, if students are coming around more to the idea that they should be open to other perspectives. 
but it certainly when when I have students in a classroom and and we talk about this idea of being confronted with speakers or events that go against what our personal morals or ideals might be, you have the choice not to go. You have the choice not to engage. You also have the choice to go and learn something new and maybe test out your own perspective and make sure that what you think is actually a valid thing to think, right? So if it, it's incorporating the rules, sure, but also, it, again, instilling the, the idea that you need to challenge yourself and challenge uh, what you think you know to be true in order to grow as individuals. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll also say, you know, I, I think we have many members of, of HXA, both in our campus community network and elsewhere, who have been thinking a lot about what an alternative uh, intentional event on campus could look like, uh, you know, that that includes viewpoint diversity uh, and that, you know, models for students uh, what real disagreement among serious academics can mean on a college campus. Um, if anyone uh, in the chat has seen great positive examples of that, we'd, we'd love to hear them. Um, but as we are thinking about that, I mean, I'll just mention a, a couple of aspects. One is we've seen uh, schools incorporate sort of a discussion, almost digestion of the speech so that you're not simply choosing to be quiet or to shout, uh, but you have a chance to sort of uh, chew on the ideas as an audience member, not just uh, not just as a, as a panelist if you're invited. Um, but again, we'd love to love to hear kind of what seems to be to be working. Uh, another best practice we've heard is something as simple as meeting face-to-face uh, -face before uh, going on stage or the lights turning on. There's something about even sharing a coffee for 10 minutes, you recognize that humanity and it tends to shift the tone a little bit, or so I'm told. Um, we're gonna be, I think, learning more about that uh, during this during this school year. Yeah. I would agree with you. And I think there are um, simple things, you know, lighting matters when you're having it. It sounds trite and silly, but people behave differently when they don't think they can be seen clearly, right? Heckling behaviors, those kinds of things. Um, it's, and that's the reason that we're so challenged in this virtual environment where people can get online and say or do whatever, this loss of civility. And so interesting that everyone is worried about my feelings, my truth, my being hurt, and yet do not hesitate to harm others. Uh, so it's a very, um, don't do it to me um, culture, uh, which is so interesting to me. Uh, we, we speak in terms of internet trolls and all those sorts of things, but this emboldened um, world that we live in now that allows people to say whatever without grounding it in truth or evidence, or it, it's everybody's an op-ed writer on social media and other things. And I, I think that allows you to do so in the darkness. Right. I mean, we see lots of um, anonymous type posts um, when we're having assemblies. We keep we light up the auditorium. I mean, you should feel confident to express yourself, but you also own your ideas, your opinions and your views. And that's not because there's consequences. It is because if you're going to stand up and share, then those things belong to you and, and, and you don't get cover of darkness for that. And it, again, it seems trite and silly. But it has a real, it, it actually tends to alter the conversation. I think the modeling is a, so our, our program for public discourse does modeling where they bring in, you know, people with different views and they will, you know, discuss it. It's not a debate per, per se, although we do do some, they do do some debates. But I think modeling is a good step. But, you know, just like you don't learn to play basketball from watching the NBA, you've actually got to go practice constructive dialogue. And to do that, I think it's more than, again, hearing an orientation, even if it was an hour in orientation about free expression and the importance of it, that still doesn't necessarily give you the skills to have a constructive dialogue. Now, theoretically, you should be learning that in class. I don't think that's happening for a, a multitude of reasons. And so I think there's, there needs to be something in the core where they are taught constructive dialogue um, at scale, right? So it's got to be, you've got to reach 
for us, it's 20,000 students. I mean, to do that, to pull something off in 20,000 students, of course, everybody wants to be in the core, right? But teaching a few folks here and there is great. Debate clubs are great, but you're not reaching everyone that needs to be reached. I, I, I think that's why, I'm sorry, yeah. to interrupt. I think that's why fundamental culture change is so critical on college and university campuses. It's not a debate class. It's not a core course. It is threaded throughout the fiber of the academic experience across the campus. Um, and, you know, to incentivize, we talk about strategies. So as the presidents or the deans or whomever, to incentivize faculty who provide a more balanced approach in their courses that really take the time to be thoughtful in selecting reading materials, for example, that present multiple perspectives and create assignments that force students to interrogate views other than their own. Um, I think it, it has to be a full saturation, if you will, to create a comprehensive learning environment that is both meaningful and impactful and will yield the results that we all seek. And that's, again, a more civil society. Ursula makes a great point in the chat. She says, maybe think about the general context of what staff and students are experiencing with quote unquote debate. In truth, it's a contrived environment on platforms like Facebook. Um, and we could probably insert mo many social networks there. So that's also, I think, uh, worth considering. It's not as if uh, students are a blank slate when they arrive. There's some sense of what arguing is like, and it's it's often online. And um, I, I'll also mention, uh, if you're not uh, looking in the chat, several folks have shared some really interesting resources, books, websites. Um, I will also shout out our friends at the Constructive Dialogue Institute, which offers some uh, sort of plug in uh, trainings and units that professors can use. Um, and then I wanted to share um, uh, one comment. Let's see. Um, Rod says, uh, the tough conversation for me is about the pursuit of truth students are so far away from a concept that there's an object to pursue. What kicks in is a sort of vanity. The only truth is, is my truth. Um, and uh, I suppose that's probably a, an age old educational challenge to get over yourself and outside of yourself and think about that external reality. Um, but um, it, it, probably speaks to what several people have mentioned. Can this be built in early in the curriculum, potentially in the core curriculum, potentially even in starting in freshman orientation or, or earlier? The whole, uh, the whole thing about my truth, I mean, maybe it's been around for a while, but I think it's a permeation of postmodernism, right? That there is no such thing of objective truth. And if if a faculty, you know, I mean, that's awesome, Rosalind, that your faculty are willing to, <laughs> to do that, but I would say two thirds of the I would guess a significant, let me put it this way, a significant percent of our of our faculty population does not probably believes it's my truth, not an objective truth. And then include, well, I'm not going to go into more details, but yeah, I, I, I think the problem is, I think there's a lot of people within academia in the faculty that do not believe that it not only is there no, you know, that the mission shouldn't be pursuit of truth, but should be social justice, but also that there is no such thing as an objective truth. And so that, well, how would you even try to pursue it? And, and that's such such a big amount of people. It's like, you know, how do you ch how do you change the beliefs of, you know, a significant portion of the faculty? Well, and, th and that goes also to kind of this activism question. So um, I, in the in the time that we have left, I'd love to put this on the table as uh, an anonymous commenter does. Uh, asking, do you see any signs that your ideas are starting to spread and become more widely accepted? Uh, and I would also add to that, um, you know, for for a faculty member who might be listening and just wondering, is there anything that can be done? Where can I get involved to try to um, raise the profile of these issues and maybe persuade some of the leaders in my institution? I mean, where do you start? I mean, we've, I think it goes back to this parallel polis idea. I don't think it's one place that starts. I think you have to leverage the external organizations. You have to leverage the board of trustees and board of governors in our case, for example. You have to go start things like the heterodox 
Yields group, you know, our Heterox campus community, creating listservs. You know, we started this committee <clears throat> and it's going to take, it'll take years. And I think, I mean, I think the fundamental question in the background for a lot of, and this is going to sound doomist, doomerist, but, you know, is, is are universities salvageable, right? I think there's a non-significant portion of faculty who think like it's just gone too far. I can't even try versus there's some that obviously like myself think there is, it's at least worth, <laughs> worth trying to do it. Right. Cause these are, you know, universities are a treasure. Um, so, you know, and, and it's hard to rebuild institutions, but you know, I, I think there, there's definitely for many faculty, it's like, I can't even, I just want to be left alone, do my research and I, I, whatever happens, happens. I can't affect it. I, that is painful to hear, right? I mean, it's sincerely, it's painful to hear. Um, certainly HXA has a whole host of resources. Michael, I'm going to help you out here. A whole host of resources to engage mm -hmm. faculty. Um, but, you know, some of the work we're doing with citizen scholars, Raj Benefotis Group um, is offering quite a bit of faculty development and really trying to think about ways to engage faculty in this conversation from multiple campuses across the country to exchange best practices and think about ways that we can um, stimulate the free exchange of ideas on these campuses. And I'm certain that there are hundreds of other examples out there. Um, in an increasingly polarized society, a lot of folks are talking about this, this issue right now. And um, fewer than the number that are talking are doing something about it, but there are resources available um, out there. Um, and several have been dropped in this chat. Several, several really good resources and books um, are out there that I think can be very invaluable. Well, I think I'll take that as a great segue uh, to uh, ask for, for some more plugs of resources, but this time as we close up, uh, I'd like to ask where our audience members can learn more from you. So if you have an online presence, if you have a book, if you have somebody else's book you'd like to plug, but uh, where where's, uh, if we, they'd like to learn more about you and your work, where could they go? Um, Mark, would you like to share anything? I mean, they could email me. I'm, I'm thinking of, of, you know, potentially writing around, I've written on institutional neutrality for heterodox and a couple other topics. Um, and I'm thinking about doing something about the parallel polis as well to kind of explain the concept. But, um, you know, if you do really want to chat about something, you could email me and that's not that hard, except I got a lot going on. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm leading, helping lead our generative AI work, but, um, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Nicole. So, um, yeah, I'll do my best. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jennifer, where can we find you or, or your group or your work online? Uh, well, my academic work is focused on primarily death and dying. So if you have interest in that, I will, uh, <laughs> I put my writing on Substack because I hear that's where all the cool kids are these days. It is. Uh, and I will throw that in the, the chat, but you can also certainly email me directly at my Western Michigan account for any sort of uh, viewpoint diversity related questions or comments or conversations. Thank you. And I, I can't recall if I said this earlier, but Western Michigan has been one of our very fastest growing campus communities. So even a little faster than you, Mark, but we can have a nice friendly competition. Um, Rosalind, where can we find you online? Oh, uh, as has been demonstrated historically, when people don't like what I do, uh, I'm pretty easy to find as president of the <laughs> college. Uh, <laughs> Someone asked, can you give us an example of when external communities have given you pushback? Oh my God, I could write a book. Um, but at benedict.edu, um, first name, dot last name at Benedict, uh, certainly feel free to email me and engage. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, let a few more suggestions flow into the chat. We've really had a, a great conversation this afternoon. Uh, and I hope that everyone uh, with us today will uh, will join me in, in thanking our panelists, not only for this conversation, but for everything that you can hear that they're doing uh, throughout the, the, the academic year uh, where they are. Um, I'll also just repeat, uh, you can find us at heterodoxacademy.org. We've got some big announcements coming out soon. You don't want to miss them. So sign up for our emails, apply for membership if you're somebody who who works or studies in the academy in any fashion um and uh and follow us on social media i suppose um thank you very much everyone we really appreciate it and uh, have a good afternoon